I really want to welcome y'all into a space where we can be 100% real and 100% us. This is not a space for people to tone police. This is not a space for us to be respectable. Because I'll be damned if I'm gonna come out here and tell you about my pain and you tell me I need to chill out just a little bit. I'm not here for that. I'm not here for it. So I'm telling you now that I don't give, I don't give a fuck, right? I don't give a fuck, y'all. I do not care because cuss words are not more offensive than blood on the street. And we can be real with that right here if y'all have any questions. But I'm telling y'all, people are worth it. And I'm not here for some, some half-assed solidarity. You show up and you sit in the fire. You know what it feels like. We feel it. We stand in it, right? We spend all day trying to push away from it. But we can't. So let's be real with all of it, right? Bump all this stuff. I'm here for liberation. And it starts, we got to liberate ourselves from the inside. So let that pain flow out of you and let's talk about it. Right? Let people hear it. Please give yourself permission to feel all the things that we have been we have been pushing down and invalidating. This blood, we remember it, y'all. It don't have to be our family to be our family. Right? And so I encourage you all, whoever wants to speak, and let me tell you right now, we're prioritizing black and brown people, right? Don't come up here on this mic if you don't represent those things. Period. I'm, I'm not even going to apologize because I'm not sorry. So we are prioritizing the people that need to speak. So you will hear our voices. And if you have any problem with that, you can go on. That's fine. But I'm right here to, to let the people speak that need to be heard. Because this is what this is about. We radically prioritize those who need to be heard. And we will do that all night. There will be no exceptions. So I welcome you all, and I hope that you feel the passion that I have because we deserve to liberate ourselves. This is not something that we just show up to when it's a one-time event. Because once you know, you know. And once you're awake, you're awake, right? So that means that this, hopefully, will transform and revolutionize the thought process that we have when we don't speak out when people show microaggressions or racism against us. So because we also have to fight capitalism if we're going to fight racism. Okay. And so if you're in a job where people are calling you a nigger all day, you might have to give up that job. Mm. And that's just what it is, right? And, but oppression is real. But that's why we need community. We need people that will help us when we need help. And we need people that will say, I need help when, when I need help. All right? So I'm so thankful for y'all coming out. And yes, it's scary, right? This world is scary as hell. But I can promise you, if you buy into this, right here, right now, in this moment, you will never feel safer. Because we all have the pain. We all feel this pain. And just because it sounds different doesn't mean it don't feel the same. You feel me? So welcome. And let's get this thing started, OK? So first we organized this event this evening for people to be able to come out and speak out and feel their pain and all of those things because we recognize that trauma is real. So we're going to let you guys drive this vehicle this evening because this is about this community. Um, and we want you guys to have the opportunity to be able to voice what you guys want to voice and tell your own truths because that's very important. So I'm going to open it up and anybody who wants to come up and speak about anything that they're feeling right now in this moment or anything that they've thought in the past, you guys are free to do so. Greetings. How are you? Good. This is my first time. So we got that. Um, I just want to say, um, should I pull up my phone? Mm -hmm. I think I should. Because I have some names that I want to say. It's about, um, I don't know, about 50, 50, 50, 50, 
black trans women that have died this year? Yes, that's right. And if y'all haven't noticed, yes, I'm trans. <laughs> and another thing, um, <laughs> I, um, I understand that there are women and men in the audience, but if you're somewhere in between, can you raise your hand, please? Anybody? Come on, it can't be just one person in between the genders. Right? <laughs> Keep your hands up, please. Anybody in the back? Nobody? Nobody? Yeah. Three, I guess that means three. Ten, you know, because some people might be afraid to put their hands up. But, um, see, that's the problem. That's because, right. Because, I mean, it's not just male and female here in America. That's right. Yeah. There are theys, there are actual people that identify as aliens. And I'm one of them. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, you know, alien, alien, but you know, psychologically have a problem. You know, I feel that I actually am not of the human race because if I were a part of the human race, that means that I'm a murderer. That means that I sit and I let things happen. I like to start wars and, you know, claim things as my own. Damn, it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's just... <laughs> Um, okay, so first person, Raylynn Thomas, say her name. Raylynn Thomas. 28 years old, Columbus, Ohio, August 10th, 2016. Same old story, she had a boyfriend. Of course, she had a relationship with her boyfriend and killed her, shot her in the head, beaten. Right. Erica um, Tigeria, say her name. Erica Tigeria. 36 years old, El Paso, Texas. Um, homicide. Sky Maccabee, 26 years old, say her name. Sky, Sky Maccabee. Cleveland, Ohio. Found dead, unresponsive in a parking lot around 8 a.m. on July 31st in Cleveland, Ohio. <sighs> Reports, Cleveland.com. Tamakabe had an apparent headwind in individuals who called her EMS. Well, found her, called EMS. She was declared dead at the scene. She was 26 years old. Dee Wigman, Dee say Wigman. her name. Dee Wigman. Dee Wigman. 25 years old. Biloxi, Miss, Mississippi. July 23, 2016, a registered nurse, originally from Shibatu, Mississippi. She was found stabbed to death in a hotel room, July 23rd. The Queen Dodds, say her name. The Queen Dodds. Died at 22 years old. 22, I'm 21. I haven't even started life, I just moved here six months ago. was shot in the neck by an unidentified attacker, probably her boyfriend, or her boyfriend's father, or anybody who assisted her probably. You know. Goddess Diamond, 
20 years old. Say her name. Goddess Diamond. New Orleans, Louisiana. <laughs> Was murdered June 5th. care about her birth name. <coughs> wow. I'm Nebula Medulla Child, by the way, and I'm 21 years old from Tampa, Florida. Say my name. Nebula. 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 Okay. Amos B. B. 38 years old. Say his name. Amos B. B is a trans man. Died of parent homicide. Was found unconscious by police on the 22nd. I can go on and on. There are so many. If you if you actually care, um, can you go on um, www.advocate.com? It's entitled "These Are the Trans People Killed 2016." Um, there's almost. Yeah, there's over 50 trans people that were killed in Brazil alone. Um, who knows in America? You know, trans lives matter. Definitely. That's right. Black trans lives matter. That's right. Brown trans lives matter. Yellow trans lives matter. White trans lives matter. Red trans lives matter. Blue trans lives matter. Purple trans lives matter. Green trans lives matter. It's all, it's all in the fabric of the world is colors. It's not just black, white, yellow. Yeah. It's <laughs> honestly. That's why I wore all these colors today to show you that it's not just black lives that matter. It's <coughs> my life matters. That's right. Here I want to be ready to that for a Purple too. You know, purple is more. Yeah. That's why I wanted to say. Give me a minute, it's been a while since I spoke. My name is Kimberly. I'm actually from Lawrence, but right? I just moved to Topeka from Oakland, California. It was awesome because in Oakland, California, I was one of the head counselors for Black Lives Matter. And I look around and I see all the people that's here today, and I smile. Well, you know, in Oakland, there's about 10,000 people out. All colors, all races loving on each other. Since I've been in Topeka, but since I've been back in Kansas, so I left Kansas when I was small. I grew up in Southern California and moved to Oakland about eight years ago. It's so different from me here. I feel like I'm in a culture shock. That's right. I feel like black people don't know who they are here. And we're strong here. I feel that black people don't love on each other like we should. Coming from Oakland, coming from an inner city, it's all love there. It's all love. You just don't see that here. And I want somebody to explain why it's not here. I feel like a lot of things have been sensitized here. I, my friends call me from Black Lives Matter in Oakland, and I see it. They see me videos. I don't see it on the news here. And it's all positive. It's nothing negative. The people that are standing on the outside of our circle, they stand up for us. They're here for us. There's a more than, than just standing here that are here. But there's also a lot here that are trying to discourage Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. by saying things like, all lives matter, mm -hmm. our blue lives matter, mm -hmm. our turkey lives matter, or whatever. Right now, I think we need to have some understanding. When someone says that to us, don't run, explain to them what Black Lives Matter is. My speech yeah. is, all lives do matter, but right now it's time for Black Lives to start loving on each other. It's time for us to stand up for what's going on around us and just not stand back and be, say it's okay. When I posted that this, they were having this today, uh, when I first posted it on Facebook, I posted it and I got about 19 inbox messages from my sisters that have black children. They're of all nationalities. They chose to date black men, they chose to marry black men, they chose to have children by black men. But their problem was,
that they couldn't understand why when they compared their lives to their black female friends, their black female friends came in a roar. See, one of the brothers said earlier, the thing is, you made a choice to date a black man and have black children. You made a choice. That's a choice. We don't have a choice to wake up white in the morning. That's right. We're black. Right. Okay? I've, I have six friends. We all hang out. I'm the only black. They didn't know. They, they touched Black Lives Matter with, you know, lightly. But we went out. We went to a supermarket, a big market. And they seen security following me around. I probably had more money in my pocket than security did. But they seen security following me around. They got upset more than I did. I'm used to it. It enlightened them. They are now asking and opened up a conversation about Black Lives Matters. They are, a lot of them said that they thought that Black Lives Matters was a separate group, separate, you know, well, we're separate and we're gonna kill. It's not about that. We're tired of killing this. Right. We're trying to love on each other and help each other, and our lives matters. And if it didn't, if, it, if our lives matters, mattered so much, we wouldn't be having this movement. I don't want my nieces and nephews, who are beautiful people of all nationalities, to grow up and have to have a Black Lives Matter. Because I just don't, so whatever I got to do, like the brother said, I'm not going nowhere. I'll be in your face. And from now on, when people say things that are so negative, I, I, I don't think it's a negative. I think that they don't get the insensitivity that comes along with it. There's nothing we can do about being black with black. Right. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm proud to be black. That's right. And it's beautiful, and everybody that loves me, I love them back. But as far as Black Lives Matter, y'all got me for life in Topeka and Lawrence. My name is Kim Johnson. Anybody else would love to speak? Okay. Well, how y'all doing? Good. Very well. And my name is Brandon Humphrey, uh, part of CBG as well as the NIA. I will say, man, I'm happy to see so many people here, and it is very touching and inspiring. And uh, I ask if there's anybody in this crowd who has listened to Malcolm X's speech, the ballot or the bullet, raise your hand. If you have heard that speech, the ballot or the bullet, raise your hand. If you haven't heard that speech, I would advise you, when you go home, YouTube it, Malcolm X, the ballot or the bullet. But what, why I brought that up is because as you listen to that speech, what you see is that as relevant as it was when he spoke it, mm -hmm. it's just as relevant today. Everything he said can be spoke today and be just as relevant. So the importance of what I'm saying is when people say, ah, because I look a lot at social media and, and a lot of people don't like you to say that black lives matter, but there's a reason. And in his speech, Malcolm, I'm gonna paraphrase, he said, who taught you to hate yourself? Who taught you to hate your skin? Who taught you to hate your nose? Who taught you to hate your lips? You gotta deal, you gotta, you gotta realize that you are dealing with the people who has been conditioned and who have been conditioned to look at self in a certain way. So you can talk about COINTELPRO, you can talk about the fear of a black messiah rising up in America who could unify the people and overthrow the system that they have already set in place to keep you in a subservient position. There's fear of that. So what I'm gonna say is, when people say that we don't want you to say black lives matter, or people get offended, it's because when you start to love yourself, you start to carry yourself in a certain manner. You start to demand a certain level of respect. You start to treat your queens different. You start to address your brothers in a different manner. You start to have a different air about yourself. And, and so when, when you say black lives matter or, or because the thing with like growth by social and the CBT, like I think it's a lifestyle. It's not, let me just go out here and see what's going on. If you believe in your heart that black lives matter, let it matter when you wake up your babies. When, when you see your son, affirm his manhood. When you, see, when you see your daughter, affirm her, not only her beauty, 
but affirm her intellect. Yes. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Because it's up to us. This next generation coming up, a lot of us, my age and older, we'll look at the younger generation and shake our heads. But this younger generation got a fire in them. And, and if we believe they misguided, then whose fault is that? But our own. You understand what I'm saying? So when I say it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a way of life, this means through every conversation, every, every, every encounter, you have an opportunity to plant a seed. You have an opportunity to carry yourself in a way that shows people more than the words. That's why they say actions speak louder than words. Because I can yell, black lives matter, black lives matter, black lives matter, and go right over here and disrespect this little sister. Verbally. And crush her whole future. And not even know that I cursed her or broke her heart. Right. Or, or broke her esteem. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But when the people begin to believe in self, when the people be begin to understand identity of self, then that is a threat. That's a threat. Because there are those who get paid off of you not knowing who you are. There are those who get paid off of you accepting a subservient position in this society. But when you stop accepting it, then there's the question of what comes next. There's the fear of if, if a certain amount of power comes, then what will be done to us? And so the thing is, our lives do matter. But if a people didn't have to say black lives. That's the thing. That's why you shouldn't even have to say it. That's why we say it. Because as human beings, I shouldn't even have to tell you my life matters. You understand what I'm saying? I shouldn't have to go out my way to make sure you know that my life matters or your life matters or his life matters. You understand what I'm saying? If you look at the history of people, we've never went all over the world pillaging, raping, and, and taking. We've never done it. But don't be afraid to move as if you believe your life matters, to speak as if you believe your life matters, to hug, to touch as you believe your life matters, or to influence others as if you believe that your life matters. Because everybody's life does matter. But we are at a time. We are at a time where people are getting tired. People are getting tired. So it's up to us to stand up. And, 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 and the thing is, we are all standing up mm. here right now for the most part. But when I say it, it's hypothetical, we are here standing up. And I, I just encourage y'all to continue to continue to stand up, continue to study up, continue to, to study the psychology of what's going on right now. Yeah. Because the easiest people to trick are the people that are asleep. You understand what I'm saying? Right. And we are, we are on the precipice of, uh, of something happening that is, that is going to be real serious in these coming days. And, and, and it, it's not just race. Right. Religion. Yes. Politics. Yeah. Economics. Look at the state of the world. So it's good to be woke. It's good to study up. It's good to love one another. Because we're coming to a point to where we are really going to need each other. That's right. More than we ever have in history. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Gotcha. So let us not sleep. Let us continue to love. Let us continue to encourage one with another and stand up. Love. He said in one of his, the danger of silence, what you talked about, he said, read critically, write consciously, and tell your truth. And that's what we need to do. So would it be anybody else, anybody else that would like to speak this evening? Say words of emotion or anything of that nature? It's okay. The microphone's not going to hurt you. There we go. That's some powerful speakers up here today. But the thing about this is, is more than just today. You know, we can get up here today in front of everybody, say, yeah, Black Lives Matter, and then walk away from here five minutes from now and go right back to the norm. We can't do that. All of y'all that are on the outside of the circle, while your friends are standing around telling black jokes, you gotta stop going for it. That's right. We've got to hold each other accountable. The only way that we can ever defeat this system is one to acknowledge that racism is alive and well today. That's right. 
And as long as you allow your brothers, your sisters, your mamas, your aunties to continue to talk about that little darky or whatever the case may be and not say anything, you're just as guilty as the man who's saying something. That's or the right. woman who's saying something. That's right. If y'all don't take a stand to correct your own, then you might as well say black lives don't matter. If you don't acknowledge the racism, racism is real and make every one that you know acknowledge the same fact, then 20 years from now, our children are gonna be right here. I don't know how many of these that I've been to right here, brothers and sisters talking about, hey, you remember 20, 30 years ago, we was right here doing this? Well, why are we back then? Why are we still here fighting for the same things? I posted something on Facebook the other day, just to see. Name three rights that black people have not had to fight for in America. I didn't get one response. Mm. And here we are, still fighting today. We're fighting for each other. We're fighting for our children. We're fighting for the right to live. That should not be the case. That's right. I shouldn't have to fight to breathe this air. Right, right. God gave it to me. That's right. I shouldn't have to fight to walk in this skin. God gave it. But I will. That's right. We're all here today, and that's that's saying something. But you should be dragging your friends. You should be dragging your 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 cousins, your brothers, your sisters, right here. Every time we have one of these, you should be bringing somebody with you, waking people up. Each one teach one. But as long as you don't, as long as you continue to go for those excuses, as long as you continue to go for the rebuttals, every time somebody say Black Lives Matter and somebody want to rebuttal with White Lives Matter or Yellow Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter, what the heck is a blue life? I ain't seen the Smurf yet. <laughs> But no, we're standing here talking about Black Lives Matter because we have to, not because we want to. That's right, Damon. And we have got to continue with this struggle. We cannot drop the ball because we can't, 20 years from now, we might not have this chance at all. But it's going to take each and every last one of us. You know, there's a lot of people that don't think that we have problems in Topeka. I'm here to tell you we do. Amen. There's problems in Lawrence. There's problems in Kansas City. There's problems in these little hick towns that we have running around here. There's problems in the system. That's right. There's problems right here. We can't just say Black Lives Matter and then because this individual doesn't have the same sexual or religious preference, act like his life don't or her life doesn't matter because they do. No, we can't just choose whose life does or does not matter. Only person that does that, only person who has control of anybody's life here is that higher power. Regardless of what you want to call him, God, Allah, Jehovah, it's that higher power. And until we realize that, until we start making everybody accountable for their actions, this is where we're going to be standing. I just want to say, y'all, you don't have to have the perfect speech or anything like that to to, be, to speak. Like you don't have to, you don't have to come up here and be fly or like do anything, right? It's in the minister show. I'm not here for that. So uh, I just want to welcome you all to speak, to breathe one one word, hundred words, whatever you want to do. I mean, I also want to say that all the black men that are here, we need to get at them too. 
right? Because if patriarchy doesn't exist, then I don't know what misogynar is. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'll say that system's a bitch. It is. Um, I want to challenge everybody who's in attendance this evening to take into consideration what they've experienced throughout their life and to determine was the outcome important. And I'll tell you why. Um, married to this woman here. She's, uh, what's that? Solution? Yeah, solution, solution focused discussions. You know, I like to bitch and complain a lot. She's like, well, why are you bitching and complaining? I'm like, stop that. But what I've, what I've learned from that is she's asking the question so that she can determine if what you're bitching about is important or not. When I say the system's a bitch, it's, its sole function is to break down and systematically oppress everyday functions, everyday rights That's of right. a specific group of people. And it's not stopping. It's growing stronger and stronger with the development of technology. I'm an IT guy, I work for Microsoft, I see it. Technology goes and people use that technology to their will. So I'll give you an example that plays in my head. I don't look black. Um, my first professional job, I had 27 inches of hair and I rocked an afro all the time. I worked for American Airlines and they said, hey, you're good at what you do, go ahead and cut that hair. I was like, screw it, they're paying me $25 an hour, I'll do it. I, I let that slide. When I would have that discussion with people, I was, oh, I wasn't professional looking or 9-11 just happened and they want to tone down, you know, how I'm supposed to look while I meet with, uh, while I come in contact with airport patrons or employees. That's what I allowed them to, to teach me and, and that's what I believe for so many years. Where was I going? Denver? 45 minutes west of Kansas. I get pulled over twice in, 30, in a 30 minute window. The first one was a felony stop. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, a felony stop is when they pull behind you in broad daylight or they show lights and they approach the right side of the vehicle. So uh, I've been pulled over before. I've had my fair share of speeding. I pull so far over to allow plenty of room for the cop not to have any interference with oncoming traffic that's close to that service lane. He walks around. He has his hand on his holster. Totally unnecessary for the purpose. When I ask why am I being pulled over, oh, some sort of incident involving a vehicle, the same description, happened within the area. I'm out in the middle of fucking nowhere. <laughs> what area are we talking about? Okay, he confirms, do you have any paperwork to, to confirm that you're running this vehicle? I show it to him, show him my ID, do whatever I need to do. He's asking a lot of questions, but for some reason I have no problem answering. Now my wife will tell you, I'm the quick to tell you, go fuck yourself and whatever. But I'm having these conversations because the system has taught me that compliance is, is, is the thing. Well, okay. Second time, I'm in the far right lane, cop pulls up behind me, no indication that he wants me to pull over. But I've seen him, I'm, again, I'm analytical, I can determine how fast he's going by how quickly he came up on me. I'm thinking he's just in a hurry. He needs to get somewhere. I signal over to the left lane. He hits his lights and pulls me over. Like, okay, what's up now, officer? Again, compliance is, is what's required. So I'm having this conversation with him. I'm not angry, I'm not upset, I should have been. Um, stay out of the left lane, it's for passing. I was in the lane for probably four seconds until you pulled me over. So what really did you pull me over for? Just stay out of the lane and have a safe trip. Okay, again, I thought nothing of it. Um, I travel a lot, so I never had an opportunity to meet with the group that my wife has been meeting with for so many, um, so many weeks. And in seeing the elections, the way that they're going, the world's financial state and race becoming such a heavy topic, you see that system begin to shape. You see that system in the, the, the people who, who, who make that machine work, they're like, oh shit. This is boiling over. We need to do something. We need to make our oppression less visible. 
let's rework our tools, let's rework our mechanisms so they just feel stupid and they feel un un unempowered. And I, I say all that to say every one of you, inner ring, outer ring, has experienced something where you think you should have handled it differently, but you didn't. And you'll probably handle a future simulate a future situation similar to what you did. I've been, I'll call it a target because I don't want to be associated with that mechanism. I've been a target of um, white privilege. I'm sorry, why, why should I not do that? Um, I've been a target of that privilege. I've gotten jobs where others shouldn't. I have a pretty decent high paying job with no college education, probably because my white interviewer liked me and how I talked. I, I can beat out anybody with a master's in my field, but I got the job based off of whatever. If they saw a lot of my experience, or if it was like, hey, I need to fill a quota. I should have been okay with that. So I'm, I'm doing what I can within my organization to make a movement like this more important to others. Microsoft talks about an internal policy of inclusion where anybody in this group could be hired, brought into the organization, and taught the trade that they need to learn. Not necessarily something like, she can't do it because she doesn't know programming, she can be taught, or this gentleman here doesn't know SQL, he can be taught, but when I review the internal discussion boards and the internal groups within the company, you, you see lesbians in Microsoft, you see gays in Microsoft, you never see a Black Lives Matter movement within Microsoft until me. Like I have the, the the processes and the procedures in place to create a group like that and try to bring more of the people that I know this matters to in that circle. Right so I really ask you guys <clears throat> look back at your look back at your life. I, I grew up in a family where racism was taught to me. My dad was black, my mom was white. My step-siblings were white. I never understood why they had all this animosity with one another. My dad was country. I was 53 when he was born. He was born in East Texas, so he is the definition of a country black man. And he did everything in his power to teach his young little nappy-headed yellow son, the world is not in your favor. I just never understood why. And when he would say the world is not in your favor, I would not even consider that it was the people in my family that were going after me, that were attacking me. That right now, <laughs> a lot of them see, oh shit, what we tried to do didn't work, and now Ashley's balling. So we need to we, we need to apologize. And it's fuck your apology. You, you made me growing you, you made my life growing up hell. One of my sisters shot me in the arm with a BB gun. I was put inside of a dryer at a young age, but because I'm a sack of potatoes, that shit was fine. I loved it. What I didn't recognize is what my sisters were sending me, the type of messages that they were trying to relate. And it was just a part of my life that I didn't pay attention to. So I feel that everybody in attendance has that responsibility to figure out what in the fuck matters to me. What in my life has happened that I may or may not have handled correctly? Do I need to change my mindset? My wife laughs at me because of the conversations we have since my last attendance. I'm am. I'm like, fuck this shit. We need to change something and we need to change something now. And that doesn't happen. It won't happen. Just like any of the other speakers that have spoke this evening. It will not happen unless every single one of us, including me, shakes our foundation and our understanding of what's right and what's wrong. So... Take some shit up, people. That's Do right. <laughs>
young African American um, girl from East Topeka, 30 years old, I have four beautiful children. I am the unstereotypical stereotype. Um, African American mother, Cuban father, and for the better part of my education, I went to predominantly white schools. Went to French Middle School on the west side of town, went to Topeka West High School. Graduated from there, um, and even during my high school period, I was a cheerleader. I was the only black cheerleader. Uh, they had a policy there that you had to have one black cheerleader and one Hispanic cheerleader. Well, they killed two birds with one stone with me. <laughs> and so, he had a situation where I felt like at times where I was there, but it was, oh, she's, she's good enough, but it's just because she's black. And then even when I got to my career field and so forth and things I've done, I've always been a token black person. There's, right now, even in my own department, um, I'm the only black person there. There's one black person in the Kansas City office, one black person in the Wichita office. And as soon as I started speaking out and started telling my own truths and even when, you know, things like Trayvon Martin happened, and I remember watching the verdict and all those things on TV, and I remember crying out and being so angry because I knew that I had black children. I knew that I was pregnant with my black son. And, you know, I looked at all those things, but I remember waking up on Monday morning and putting a smile on my face and being so angry because I knew that I had to squash it, I had to squash that in order to get along, in order to keep my job, in order for everything to be okay, in order for me to be able to provide for my family at the end of the day. And it made me furious. And then, even then, still wasn't woke. Still wasn't woke. And I remember watching a few weeks ago, Blonda Castile on Facebook Live and that being all over the media. And watching this man being shot, dying beside his woman, her videotaping all of this and having their baby girl in the back seat of the car. And I remember thinking to myself, I cannot do this anymore. That's right. Why are we not doing more? Why are we not raising up? Why are we not, why are we not raging against this machine that has been brought against us on a That's regular right. basis? And I remember going to work and, and not even a few weeks ago, but even before then, and I remember being told, man, you're so much more opinionated now. And I know what the connotation behind that is, is that you're so much more black now. Well, I've always been that. <laughs> I've always been brown. I can't change it. I can't wipe it off. And so it's been an interesting process to learn myself in all of this. And what I would urge you guys all to do is get to know you and to be unapologetically yourself because at the end of the day, you're not going to be anybody else but yourself. And so if there's anybody here that feels like that, please, I urge you to be yourselves, to be authentic, to tell your own truth at the end of the day, because at the end of the day, guess what? Those coworkers, those people you went to school with, the people that you come in contact with at the end of the day in your communities, guess what? Some of them may really care about you, some of them may really love you, but guess what? You go home with yourselves at the end of the night. That's right. You watch those things on the news every evening. You read things like Malcolm X and you read things like Martin Luther King and all of those things and guess what? You cry those same tears. And, but the only thing is, is that you don't have to get up on Monday morning and put a smile on your face if it's not really real. So, what I would urge you guys to do is to do that. Be unapologetically yourself because that's something I had to learn and it's been such a liberating experience. And been so freeing to be able to say, you know what, at the end of the day, I'm going to be me. And it's okay for me to not be okay with the things that have happened and the injustices that happened not only to myself, but the people that are my family members. That happened in Ferguson. That happened in Baltimore. That happened in L.A. and all of these other places across the nation for decades and for hundreds of years because at the end of the day, they are me and I'm them. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. has a saying, a quote that I found years ago, and it's been my favorite, and it describes being woke. It says, may you live every day of your life. And the first time I saw it, I'm like, why would somebody say that? <clears throat> may you live every day of your life. Because there are a lot of people that are walking around and they're not living. That's right. The experience that Mari had, I had a similar situation. I was working 
at an agency and I was the only black female doing my job. And it was killing me. I would go to work and I would do my job. I love what I do. I work with kids. I love it. I absolutely love my job. But the system dictated how I was supposed to do my job. And I wasn't supposed to do my job to my full potential. I was supposed to do my job to their full potential. Mm -hmm. And it was killing me. And so I decided I'm not going to live that way anymore. And I woke up January, actually before then, because I decided I was going to walk away from that. But the thing that really shook me to this whole Black Lives Matter thing was the Philander Steel thing. Because I have a son, I have a 17 year old son, and I have about 17, 18 nephews, and I have brothers, and I have a husband, and I have a father, and I have cousins. And to have to sit down with my son and have a conversation about what you need to do if you are ever stopped by the police shook me to my core. If anybody knows my son, you know that he's the kind of kid I should never ever have to have that conversation with, ever. But for me to have to have that conversation with my son, I was angry, I was terrified because the situation with my husband driving to Colorado happened shortly after. And that also bothered me because a lot of the responses that his family had to the whole Black Lives Matter thing pissed me off, quite frankly. And it's probably a good thing that we've never met face to face because it wouldn't be pretty. Where's Caleb? They can catch these fists. Where you at? <laughs> Absolutely. They can catch these hands. Whatever. Because that's where I'm at right now. Because I'm angry about the fact that I have to have that kind of conversation with the males in my life simply because I want to see them again. That's right. I can't. I live every single moment now. Not just every day. Every single moment because I don't know. We just took my nephew to Emporia State yesterday. And I am terrified that something is going to happen to him. I have to give him over to God. Every male in my family, I have to give over to God because I don't know if somebody is having the wrong day at the wrong time and encounter them. And I know them. I know that they're not going to do anything crazy. But guess what? Whoever they encounter doesn't know them. They don't know that they're a jokester. They don't know that they like to have fun, that they like to live life every single day. And that could cost them their lives, and it shouldn't happen. That's right. We should not have to live thinking about the fact that the people that we love, we may not see in the next hour. It is 814 right now. Think about the fact that at 914, you may be missing somebody in your life just because they're living the moment to the fullest and they encounter the wrong person at the wrong day and the wrong time. It shouldn't be that way. Not in the United States of America. It should not be that way. I spent the last however many days watching the Olympics and it's bittersweet for me because black women, black girls rock. We are rocking it at the Olympics. But it's bittersweet for me because those girls and they're running around, they're, they're draping themselves in the, the flag, and they're heroes right now. But my God, what happens when they come home? Right. That's right. We're going to ride that coast for, what, maybe three or four months, the Olympics are over, and then all of a sudden, you're black again. So, you're not a hero anymore. We'll talk about you every now and then, maybe the next time somebody breaks your record, and then we're going to put you right back here. In this little box right here. This is how we need you to act. This is how we need you to talk. And this is how we need you to be. Time out for that, y'all. It's time out for that. It is time out for us to have to worry about where people are in our lives. Every single time I hear something on the news, the first thing that goes through my head is a checklist of all my brothers, my dad, my nephews, my son. Where are they? Are they okay? And it's time out for that. It's time out for that. I'm challenging everybody here. Every single person here. I'm sorry, my husband's here. I'm challenging, like he said, I'm challenging every person here. You live your truth. But you need to come to serve terms with what your truth is. If you're here, people know you're here. They've seen that you're here. They've seen you recognizing that black lives matter. Stay with that. Don't change it because I'm going to call you on it. If I see you and I hear something and you're not with me, I'm calling you on it. That's right. I'm calling you.
I'm just going to speak for a moment. I'm an attorney. I came from New York. I moved to Lawrence, Kansas. I've been there ever since. I've been there since 20 years. During the time that I was in Lawrence, Kansas, the whole internet thing just blew up. In fact, when I first saw a computer, it still had bullet in it. <laughs> the whole thing about what's going on with us and police has been going on for decades. That's right. But people like me didn't know about it simply because I'm not going to read page 37 of the New York Post to find out that happened. But with the internet and with phones coming up to the level that they are, where everybody's taking videos of what's going on, that kind of brought a new light to everything. And when I think in terms of what Black Lives Matters is doing, when I first heard it, I, I, I Googled it. <laughs> I Googled it to find out what it was all about. And when I found out what it was about, I said, they got something right. We get a lot of things right. But this one, this one is on the money. But what really bothers me is how people take it out of context. That's right. When you say Black Lives Matter, as I understand it, the movement is about what the police are doing to us and getting away with it. That's right. There is no control over that. And as an attorney, when I hear about the grand jury decided, I'm like, oh yeah? <laughs> Who decided? Who gave them the evidence? And, and when you really find out from those cases where they tell us something, the evidence that was given to the, to the grand jury, you might as well have thought that the, the attorney was the defense attorney for the police. That's right. And when I read about what Black Lives Matters is doing in what they are requesting, I said, I got, to, I got to stand behind that. But me, I'm one of those people, I really don't have a lot of time, I'm a busy person. And yet, when I'm on Facebook, which I'm on Facebook a lot, and I'm reading what people have to say about Black Lives Matter, in fact, I was on the site today and somebody was talking about how gangbangers had killed a little kid over in Kansas City, which is a common event. But to me, I feel for that, I hurt for that. We need to do something about that. But that has nothing to do with Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, yeah, but the movement is about police killing black. In ways that it's just um, it's just not thinkable. To shoot a man who's running away from you, to shoot a man who's reaching for his wallet because you told him to get his wallet, those things should not be happening. There are some crazy people out there, and I hate to say it, I think Trump has really shown us that there's a lot of them crazy Amen. people out there. That's right. So I just want to say to everybody here that. When you are on the internet, when you're on Facebook, whatever, and you see people talking about Black Lives Matter, make sure they're keeping it in context. Because one way to destroy a movement is to broaden it beyond its path. And people keep broadening it and broadening it till it has no meaning no more. And to be quite truthful with you, you did I was looking at a video where one of the brothers of Black Lives Matters was talking to the planning commission in Lawrence. I was like, whoa, go get them. But I came out today to show support. I don't know if I'm going to be running around and doing a bunch of going before councilmen and going before these people in there. But I keep in contact with what I read, what I hear. And from meeting the people who are going out and doing something to let them know 
I got you back. You need me? Call. Hit me up on Facebook. At Facebook. <laughs> hey, that's where I hang out sometimes. Whether you like it or not, right. that's it. But I just wanted to say, let's keep things in context. Let's talk about what we are here for and what it is we're planning to do. Because that way we have purpose. Without a purpose, we're just out here right here. My name is PJ. Not a not a dynamic speaker like some of these other brothers out here, but uh, I'm sitting here I'm sitting here listening and I'm just questioning myself like I was listening to the brother that just got the wind and he's saying let's keep this in contact. To me issue that's not being brought up is in Black Lives Matter, which I'm bringing up now because it, 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 it needs to be addressed, is the fact that it's not just systematic injustice, it's not just the police brutality. We're out here killing each other. I gotta say a few names. Michael Holly, say his name. Jonathan Young. Ontario Johnson. I didn't know this brother well. I don't know his real name. Played ball with him. The respect of the man, Diddy. His, his girlfriend and their unborn child. It's just, I mean, these are things that need to be brought to the table and, and addressed just as well as the police brutality. Because when you when you look around, there's the police brutality, it's more systematic than justice of how they weave through the law and bend the law and flex the law to incarcerate. That's my problem with the system. But my, gotta look at the other side of the book as how we're gonna put the pressure on the city which puts the pressure on the state, which puts the pressure on the nation, when we're not putting the pressure on ourselves. We need to look around and check ourselves and, and, and just stop the mat. Because we're not killing each other because of, of, of I can't even think of a, a, a legit reason to kill us. Right. That's right. <laughs> it, 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 it's just senseless. And, and I'm not I, I'm not saying that one shouldn't protect itself or protect his family. I'm saying that the nonsense needs to stop. I, I, I've challenged people on Facebook, I challenged the world on Facebook to for a ceasefire. And, and, and a couple of days later, we use, we lose uh, the brother Diddy and his family. And it's just, I, I mean, I don't know what to do. I expected a, a lot of different people from the streets to show up so I can actually challenge them face to face because, I mean, as of a few months ago, I, I probably would have been ripping and running out of it. I, uh, brother Caleb woke me up at the visual in the Hmm. which made me check myself. So, I, I mean, the people I still associate with, surprisingly, they're checking their stuff. So, I mean, hopefully it's just, a, it's just a fire that just keeps growing and growing to the point where we can check ourselves and simultaneously check what's going on in the country. That's right. As I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big speaker. I mean, I just, I definitely wanted to address that because, I mean, that's, 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 that issue is not going to get through the world. I need to bring it to the light. Thank you. Real quick, you guys, I'm going to go ahead and start passing out candles here in just a few moments so that we guys can have those and we're free to light and we light, okay? Thank you. 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 Um, yeah. My brother here, PJ, he just, um, spoke on what, I was, what was on my mind about, um, we killing each other and all that. But I want to add on to that. We need to have a different outlook on how we look at each other. You see what I'm saying? If we have a different outlook, when I look at you, right, and I get angry, and I don't have the, the, the image of you as my brother, and your life is sacred, that's easy for me to kill you. But if we all had that outlook, when I look at you, when I look at you, you my sister. Your life is sacred. 
if we had that outlook, that would help us not so easily kill each other. And another thing I want to uh, speak on was we have to bridge the gap amongst the generations. Old okay. black men, young black men, the church, the synagogue, and all of that. It de that needs to come together. All black men, do not be scared of these youngsters out here. Youngsters, please respect the elders because they done lived it, they done done it. Um, the loyal brother, he done been, he done been there, he know. He grew up during that time. He was there firsthand. He knows, you know, the wickedness of the enemy. And I just want to let y'all know that, put that on your mind. It's like, I guess, people's up here, you know, giving challenges and all that. I want to challenge y'all to look at y'all brothers as they life is sacred and this is actually your brother. And please, y'all, let's, let's bridge the gap. This has been my, I wasn't born here, but I was three months old when I moved here in 59. And uh, so Topeka's my home. I, I remember the, after the 66 tornado, all this was new stuff. Hmm. To come to Ripley Park was like a privilege. And then over the years, I've just seen things turn. And some of that's our responsibility, and some of it is just a lot of things not working well within our own personal system our churches, our schools, our, our government. But as a, as a pastor, I used to think uh, y'all hated me because I was a Christian. <laughs> but then the more and more I got educated, especially by the Black Lives Movement that's holding everybody accountable, some of the reason I knew I was being disliked was because I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't doing the things that the Bible says you're supposed to do. I wasn't showing up at the places. And, and I felt like I've done that all my life, but even more so now, my presence here is so, so important. To know that I'm, I'm with you and that black lives matter no matter what kind of black life it is. If it's an atheist black life, it matters. <laughs> If it's a white black life, it matters. I'm a black life that matters, you know, and, and, I, and I think my life has to line up to something that can be used because the other part that I found out about the Black Lives Movement, and, and Caleb has really blessed me in this area. He has found so much information into me. He's always looking at me saying I'm an encouragement to him, but what has happened is that he has given me the weapon of information and it's a systemic information and, and, it, and it flows and, and I can present it anywhere I go and no one can argue with me. I'm in college now, <laughs> went back to college. Why? Because I'm getting more information not to go get a job, could be a part of the whole capitalist thing. If, if I never pay off that loan, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna use it to be able to help us. I, I wanna go get my master's degree, go into private practice, why? To help us, to enlighten us. But what Caleb has taught me is when you can take that information and then don't back down from it. Because my mouth keeps me in trouble. I know I haven't had some jobs because I refuse to buy into the system. But but that's what we're inviting you into. When we say Black Lives Matter, it, it's got to be more than us doing what we do here. But it's you embracing something so intensely that whether you're by yourself or you're within a group, that's what you put out there to the people. You, you bring a consciousness to people to let them know this is what's really going on in the system. That the system is tilted. There is not justice in America. Not a justice for all. But then, like I said in Lawrence, there's just us. And we a whole lot of us. <laughs> when, when you think about it, I, I I feel you don't have to you don't have to build a safe place, I found out when I come around us. I already okay. feel safe. There's okay. something about what radiates from us that makes me feel safe, that makes sense of the senselessness that goes on around us. And the more I'm here, the, the less I know what I thought was comfortable wasn't comfortable at all. 
if I can get a transgender person to stand with me for justice, and I'm a pastor, but then I can't get a good church being God, who, who's really with me? That's the kind of love that we have. And, and, and I, we got to be clear. That whole thing over at Mount, uh, uh, New Mount Zion, that got flipped. The media messed it up because it was not an expression of who we are. Because this is who we are. That's right. And, and, and this is inviting. This is something that encourages me and that empowers me. You don't have to worry about whether or not I'm going to be involved. Only thing you have to be worried about is if you're going to stand where you said you was going to stand. <laughs> we're going to stand together. That's my concern. It's not so much about how they spin us because I know what we're about. I know right. we're about justice. I know right. we're not about going, I'm tired of us killing us. But I also know the cost that it takes to be us. It costs you to be in this group. You're going to lose some friends hanging out with us. So if you ain't ready for that, leave now. If, 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 if you proclaim truly in your heart that black lives matter to you, it's going to cost you some family. It's going to cost you a job. And then we still won't get up here if 350 show, fine. But if 25 show, it's still relevant. That's right. If two of us show, it's relevant. That's right. Now put that in the paper. I hope they still here. You know, <laughs> you know, talk, talk about what really went on at Ripley Park at the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, movement. Because it, it is a movement. And, and we're bigger than what you see in front of you. But, but I, I, I need to drill this into our head. It costs a lot to stand where you're standing at right now. There's some preachers that's distanced themselves from me because I stood on the stage with folk that wasn't like me. But I'm the, I'm, I'm a, my sanctuary is the community. I am at church. This is the church. I am at church. The church is not a building. And, and, and what we're representing is justice. And I tell you, when you do that, you don't have to fight about people about religion and beliefs and stuff like that because like I said earlier y'all was mad at me y'all y'all didn't hate me because I was a Christian you hated me because I wasn't because I didn't show up and I wasn't in places where Christians are supposed to be and I, I didn't represent love to the extent that it's supposed to be but I'm better now That's right. <laughs> I'm in a good space now and 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 we're growing and we're building momentum That's right. and things are going to change they're not going to happen overnight but every time that we could plant a seed into someone that's willing to stand where we're standing at tonight and to stand that stand after you leave here, that's what this thing is all about. So, so, so I love y'all. I thank y'all for embracing me and allowing me to be a part of it. And I, I know I look good because this is what happened when Black Lives Matter, you look as good as I look at 57. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Vicki Carter. I'm Pearson, PJ's Carter, PJ Carter's mom. I have five sons, and uh, I have twelve grandchildren of uh, that are not black. <laughs> and I feel like they're going to go through a lot of things. Uh, so I'm here in support of my sons, not only my sons but my husband, and and for the community. And I'm going to sing a little song and then I'm going to move out of the way. Reach out and touch somebody's hand. Make this world a better place if you can. Reach out and touch somebody's hand. Make this world a better place. If you can, take a little time out of your busy day to give encouragement to someone who's lost their way. Or would I be talking into a stone if I ask you to share a problem that's not your own? We if we start giving, why don't you reach out and touch somebody's hand? Make this world a better place if you can. 
reach out and touch somebody's hand. Make this world a better place if you can. Yeah. 